a kind of rest that the world couldn't ever offer. Rest that taps me in the back, reminding me that you are God, the God who loves me all the same. Despite all sorrow and shame, let my feet step into the solid ground, his sure foundation, a place where I can walk and rest and walk again, a place of grace. Good morning. <clears throat> Pastor Patrick won't be with us this uh, morning. He's uh, out with his family, and it's a privilege for me to be able to share the word this morning. But before that, I uh, just want to give us a recap of what's happening in the next generation. Recently, we've been doing a lot of recollection for the schools of the gig, and the goal is really to share the gospel, minister to different schools. I think we have a picture of that. We're, we're in partnership with the gig government. We call it the gig cares. Our campus missionaries, our victory group leaders are there in different schools, <clears throat> sharing the gospel, ministering to them with the hopes that uh, they will get to know who Jesus is. And if you are a leader who's been helping out in the gig cares, I want to I wanna honor you for just giving up your time, sacrificing your time, and just being out there ministering to the next generation. So if you're here, can we give them a round of applause? Just, just investing time in shaping the next generation towards Jesus. And I also want to honor one of our ushers. Um, his name is Pete Pechon. And um, he recently just passed away. And I just want to honor him in front of everyone. He's been serving the church for 18 years. And um, he got sick. And now he's um, entered the joy of our master. And I uh, just want to honor him in front of everyone. So as we begin today, a new series called place of grace, um, some of us, like Rich mentioned a while ago, is, are not here anymore. <laughs> Probably um, they're out already uh, doing resting and um, having wonderful time with their families. And that's good and that's wonderful. But the prayer is that there will be a time where we'll be able to reflect on who Jesus is. Sometimes it's just about, oh, it's Holy Week. Let's have a party as if there's nothing that we are observing. And a while ago, we were walking, uh, not walking, we we're driving, and we see people uh, walking with, what's that in Filipino? Falas pas, what, what do you call that? Uh, palm. And, 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 and we were explaining to our kids, uh, why are they walking with different kinds of palms? <laughs> I don't know how you call it, but uh, we said that they were walking and, I don't know, doing a, a trying to relive the triumphal entry. And some people even uh, have themselves crucified in this Holy Week, thinking that, you know, I, we can redo what Jesus has done. Maybe it's something that I could sacrifice for, for God to forgive me or to love me. And it's a different story. One is, on the one side, there are those who would party and do a lot of recreation and forget about what is being celebrated. On the other side is that there's an overly religious experience where we try to do things over and over again so that we can do what Jesus has done on the cross. And um, the prayer is that we will take time to reflect on what Jesus has done on the cross. And one of the things that we can do is like Rich mentioned a while ago, we have Holy Week dev devotionals. Um, it's from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday. Every day, you know, you can go out, be with your families, and do recreation. At some point in your day, just take time and reflect of what Jesus done on the cross. And we also prepared this devotional. It's called, is it Tanikala? Yeah, I think we have a, 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 a photo of that. You can just show it. And, and, and the heart is it's, it's in partnership with CBN Asia. And um, watch it with your family. Take time to process it. Take time to pray about it. And really more, make this whole time of break more meaningful for us, more than just um, um, enjoying the, the season. So that's our prayer. We will reflect on what Jesus has done on the cross. And this is another question that we can reflect on. Have you ever fought 
for something in your life, but you still failed. Has it ever happened to you? You, tr- any, anyone who loves sports here? One, two. Okay, hopefully this summer, this break, <laughs> we can be a bit sporty, but um, you trained so hard. You trained so much. And then eventually, you lost the competition. Or maybe uh, you're looking for a job. You, are, you prepared a lot about the company, about the nature of the job, and you did your assignment, you had your interview, and then you thought you aced the interview, but eventually, you didn't get the job. <clears throat> or you courted someone, and you did everything, you research, research, and you, you, you befriended the family, you did everything right. And then you ended up hearing, hi, bro. <laughs> you, you, you went into the bro zone, you went to the friend zone, you thought everything was right. And it's, it's something that is painful, isn't it? But, but it's okay to be in a bro zone. You know, I've, I've, I've uh, officiated weddings that they were kuyas in the company, <laughs> and then they ended up being together. So that's not bad. I know the friendship is a baseline of, 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 of a relationship. But sometimes, you know, you feel that, you know, uh, I miss you, you'll message. Thank you, bro. <laughs> sometimes you would feel somehow rejected. But um, how do we deal with failures? Anyone? How do we deal with failures? Sometimes we can take it positively. We can take it in a way that, you know, accept our failures and make the necessary adjustments and move forward. And sometimes we can take it with humility, you know. Um, I didn't get the job, but you know, God, you will help me. God, I can do, get a better job, but you will help me. But, I know, but you, can, you can have the recognition or take it as a challenge, right? I, I, I lost this competition. I'm going to train harder. I'm going to do it better. I'm going to invest more time to be better. <clears throat> and there are also those would have negative responses. We will wallow in our self-pity. Kawawa naman ako. You know, I, 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 what have I done wrong? You wallow yourself in your failure and self-pity. Sometimes it could be apathy. Okay lang yan. But deep inside, it's not okay. We try to self-preserve with the feeling of the pain and say, okay lang yan, okay lang yan. But it's not really okay. Another response with the sour graping. Alam nyo ba yung sour graping? Um, you would say, well, I didn't, I didn't really like that job anyway. Toxic yung boss doon. But deep inside you, you want that job. So, mapait pas ang palaya, no? So, you, 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 you sound bitter. You sound bitter in, in, in not getting the job. And the other one is sweet lemoning naman. Or they call it sweet lemon. No, I'm glad the courtship is over. At least now, I can move on with my life. But deep inside you, there's a light here. You want to you feel good about something that has happened. And um, the question is, how do you feel? What do you do whenever you fail God? Those things, some things are external, but when you fail, when you fail God, what do you do? Do we have the tendency to justify sin? And we say, no, I have the right to do it. I was wrong, so I can retaliate. We end justifying when we sin against God sometimes. Or sometimes you feel that God will just understand. I was ministering a long time ago to a friend. And um, they were not in an honoring situation with the Lord. They were fornicating. And I talked to him, bro, do you know that um, the Bible says that we are not to have any hint of sexual immorality and sex is supposed to be for married couples only? And what the person said, ah, nag-usap na kami ni Lord. Ano pinag-usapan nyo? <laughs> nag ba si Lord? Somehow, he was mentioning that God was lowering down his standards for him so that they can have that relationship. That could be our tendency. And the question is, do you take it with humility? When you are wrong, when you sin against God, do you recognize that you sin? So our text for today is Mark 14, 26 to 31. I'd like to invite everyone to stand up as we read the word together. (coughs) 
Mark 14, 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the, to the Mount Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the, the rooster crows, twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Let's pause for the word of prayer. Lord, we thank you, God, <clears throat> that as we go through the preaching of the word, God, we would understand there is a place of grace, but there's also a place for repentance, and there is a place for obedience. Lord, thank you that you are with us as we talk about your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can all now take your seats. Just to give us a background of Mark. Mark is one as the shortest book of uh, uh, shortest of the Gospels, and uh, more than talking about Jesus, it also talks about discipleship. It talks about uh, following Jesus. That um, in following Jesus, suffering is part of it. Jesus is portrayed as a suffering servant, and fellowship with God includes trusting Him, obeying Him, confessing to Him, and being loyal to Him even in the point of rejection. So at this very point, uh, the disciples were already experiencing miracles through Jesus. They were in front row seats in Jesus' teachings. So somehow, medyo kilala nila si Jesus here. They, they already know who Jesus is. They know Him as God. They know Him as Lord. And um, they just had a meal. They just had a Passover meal. And this is where Jesus already said, I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to do the greatest sacrifice for you. And um, he will take the, away the sins from lost sinners. And then after that, it seemed to be a good ending. Verse 26, it says, And they had sung a hymn. They went out to the Mount of Olives. So after having the, the Lord's Supper, they went out, they, they sung hymns, and then it was a joyful ending of their dinner. And because it was already late at the time, uh, they wanted to encamp still in Jerusalem, near Mount Olives. And then suddenly you see here, um, Jesus shifted <clears throat> his countenance. Ang saya niya, they had a wonderful Passover meal. They were singing hymns, and then Jesus said in verse 27, all of a sudden, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is I will, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So imagine that, no? You, you were... You were in a dinner with Jesus, but Jesus knew what's going to happen. He's going to die on the cross. He had a wonderful celebration. This is what's going to happen to me. I'm going to die on the cross. I will, be, I, I will die. I will resurrect, but you know, I, I, I will come again. And then you were singing hymns, praising God, and then all of a sudden, Jesus shifts. You know what? You're going to fail me. You know what, Jesus? You know what? You will scatter when I get arrested. There was, throughout the verses that we're going to read, the theme is abandonment. Just before Jesus was arrested and during his arrest, his disciples abandoned him. His disciples failed him. <clears throat> it says here, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. This is actually a prophecy in Zechariah 13, 13 verse 7. It says here, strike the shepherd and the, the sheep will be scattered. So, what do we see here? Jesus knows that they're going to fail him. Jesus knows the inclination of the hearts at that at very moment of danger, at the very moment that they will be persecuted, at that very moment, you're going to fail me. Because why? Because he's God. He's also omniscient. At the same time, it's a prophecy in the Bible. So, in short, he's saying then, I know you will fail me. But in verse 28, it says, but after I am raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Meaning, I know you will fail me, but I will meet you after my death. Isn't that gracious? I know you will fail me. I know you will deny me. I know this, 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 and that, but I'll meet you. My sheep will be scattered, but I am still your shepherd. Verse 29, <clears throat> here comes Peter. Any one of you can relate with Peter? He went into the scene and say, 
You know, even though they fall away, I will not. So somehow he exalted himself, sila, they will fall away, but I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, crows or crows? Crows, okay. <laughs> um, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, I must die with you. I will not deny you. And they all said the same. What was the trait of, of Peter that made him say that? Self-assurance maybe? Or self-preservation? Or maybe pride? That there's a self-proclaimed strength that, you know, these guys will fail you, but I won't. Lord, solid ako. I'm a solid Christian and I'm not gonna fail you. He exalted himself before others. None of us are like that, right? Sila yun, ako hindi. We don't do that, right? And um, he had no difficulty believing that he was self-exalted and the disciples were beneath him. And Jesus, being the wise man that he is and the wise God that he is, he put him in his place. You distinguish yourself from being one who is exalted, you're gonna fail. So he put him in his place and he said, but if I... If I must die with you, I will not deny you. So meaning he was so sure. He was so sure in his heart that he's not going to fail Jesus. And bandwagon, have you heard of bandwagon? And the other said the same. Me too. <laughs> I'm not going to fail you. So all of them had the same guilt of, you know, I can do this. They will arrest you. I, I will not fail you. And now we go to the stories of Peter denial. The story of Peter's denial. Mark 14, 66 to 72. We'll read the whole thing uh, very briefly. It says here, as, And as Peter was below the country yard, courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. Seeing Peter warming himself, she, took, she looked at him and said, You also with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. The Peter, who was so zealous for God, said, I don't understand what you mean. And then another person saw him, the bystander. The bystander said, the man is one of them. But he denied it again. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them for you are a Galilean. And then he said, I do not know this man whom you speak. Hindi ko nga siya kilala. And after all the things that happened, he broke down and wept. So what you can see here, it's not that he wanted to deny Jesus. It's not that he was just, it was just a show saying that I will not deny you. He really was so sure that he won't. But he failed. He broke down and wept. He was not able to stand up for Jesus. You know that happened to me um, some time ago, um, maybe probably almost two decades ago. It's my friend's wedding. And I planned that night. I was a young Christian back then. So just to give you context. I was trying to marry <clears throat> two worlds. Uh, my, my lifestyle of a lot of vices and a Christian. So sometimes I would say, I, I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to get drunk. So that day, I've made a resolve that I'm not going to get drunk. I'm going to preach Jesus to my friends. So I drank. <laughs> so I, I thought I could not get drunk. I, I thought, that, no, I, drunkenness, I'm not going to get drunk, but I'll just be socializing with them and share the gospel eventually. So I, I at first, I would say, you know, I'm already a Christian, this and that. You know, I'm not going to get drunk, this and that. But you know, you know, the power of alcohol is not just, you can stop anytime. So I ended up drinking. And one of my decisions also is that if I won't get drunk and I won't do the crazy stuff after drinking. And so I got drunk. 
I got wasted. But prior to that, I was proclaiming, I'm a Christian. And um, a friend asked, are you drunk? <laughs> and I said, um, yes. And then he asked me this question. Did you also take off those crazy stuff? I said, yes. And I ended up, I went home, 5 a.m., woke up in the morning, and said, Jesus, I failed you. I was supposed to represent you that night. I was really so, so sure I'm not going to get drunk. I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm so sure that I will be a good testimony. They will see their weakness as alcoholics, and I'll be the one who's strong. But I ended up wallowing in self-pity. God, Jesus, I failed you. And that's also a turning point for me that I could not marry two worlds. I have to decide, Jesus, are you real to me or not? But I am as guilty as them. I failed Jesus. And has that ever happened to you? You were supposed to stand firm for Jesus, but you failed? You were supposed to stand for the Christian values, but you follow the world. Jesus expects us to stand firm for him when the world calls us to desert him. Next would be the sleeping disciples. The disciples were sleeping when they were tasked to intercede. The Jesus asked them to watch and pray, and they slept. <laughs> So we don't know the reason why. Probably it's late already. Probably busog, no? Um, or probably it's apathy. You know, Jesus is praying. Jesus is up there. I'll just, what's wrong about resting? What's wrong about sleeping? Or maybe a misplaced priority. Mark 14, 32 to 37, it says, And they went to a place called Gethsemane. <clears throat> and he said to his disciples, Sit here. Jesus was clear. Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and, and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful. So Jesus was very weak internally at this time. He was emotional. He said it, that his soul was very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. Meaning don't sleep. Pray for me and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass for him. So Jesus was somehow having a difficulty processing that he's going to die. In his humanity, he was sorrowful. And he said, Abba Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but, you, but, but your will. And he came and found them sleeping. So imagine that Jesus was so uh, emotionally down, it was, was, was in agony of what's going to happen, and then you see your friends sleeping on you. Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for an hour? Strike one for the disciples. Jesus was clear in saying, I, I want you to be with me. Can't you stop looking after yourself and be with me for an hour? Can't you sacrifice an hour for me? Can you prioritize me, not your convenience? And when I was reading this, I somehow felt guilty at times when I've put my convenience at the forefront. And um, I just could imagine the disciples having the reasons. They were so sleepy. Have you ever been in that place? You were so sleepy, but you need to be awake. Probably in your Monday meetings, you're doing, <laughs> you're falling asleep because you had a wonderful Sunday dinner. And I could remember uh, when we had our first child, Rafa. So um, my wife was in labor, and um, there's such thing as recovery room, right? Recovery room is where the 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 mom sleeps. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if they are sedated. They just get to sleep. And me, uh, firstborn, uh, I was so paranoid that I might end up, because we had a long labor that night. And um, I was so scared not to be 
waking up that everything is already happening, but I'm, all, I'm, I'm just asleep because I, we didn't have sleep the night before. So I ended up not sleeping. <clears throat> when there, well, 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 Linny was wonderfully sleeping, sedated, everyone sleeping, I was trying to be awake. And when he came back from recovery room, I was so sleepy. And I, I just couldn't, I want to carry, I was so afraid, might, might drop the baby. I was just so sleepy. But in our second baby, I learned my lesson. Um, I slept like a baby. Recovery room? Okay. <laughs> I'll sleep right away. I say this story because at that very point, I just felt how sleepy the disciples were. And it's a human need, isn't it? They, I have to sleep. But Jesus was saying, watch and pray, verse 38. You may not enter into temptation. This is the second time. Watch and pray. Do not sleep. Can't you give an hour? And then verse 28 says, you may not watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. All that to say that they were given strike one for them, Jesus understood. Jesus understands our weaknesses, but calls us to understand to overcome them. Uh, call us to trust God to overcome them. So meaning, they understand your difficulty. God, God understands your difficulty. But it doesn't mean you're okay. The call is to trust Him. It doesn't mean that you are weak. I'll do this. This is where I am right now. Yes, God understands. But He calls Him to trust you in obedience. Because the issue here is devotion to God. Not for personal convenience. Verse 39. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, and again, no? He came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. They were just weak. They were just physically weak, but God was, ex Jesus was expect expecting them to be there for him. Have you ever been in that situation? You were just so weak. Something in you wanted to cheat on something because you don't want the inconvenience of doing of what is right. Sometimes our flesh, uh, the natural feeling sometimes is to be angry, to hate and not forgive. But Jesus understands what it means to be abandoned, but he calls us to trust him in all these relational dysfunctions. So strike two for them. Verse 41, and he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping? I just could imagine, no? Parang, Jesus has been telling them to wake up and be there for him. All they did was just find for a moment wherein Jesus is gone, I'll sleep again. I just want to do what I want to do. And it's a difficult one because it's something that is physically taxing for them, but Jesus called them to be there for him. And then Jesus said to them, the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Strike three for them. Prioritizing oneself is one of our biggest obstacles in obeying Jesus. We want to take the easier route always. We want to take what is convenient for all of us. The nature of sin is loyalty to the flesh and rebellion to God. It says this in Genesis 3 verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, self, and it was the light of the eyes, self. And what the tree was to be desired to make one wise, self. She took of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some of the, to her husband who was with her and ate it. New Testament confirms this. 1 John 2, 16 to 17. For all that is in the world is the desire of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's the self. It's the love of self that makes us abandon Jesus. <clears throat> I wrote here a song 
but I'm not sure if I'm gonna sing it. <clears throat> it's by Whitney Houston. Anong number yan? I don't know. No, I won't. So, <laughs> the greatest love of all. The, the greatest love of all is loving yourself. I want to sing it because I can't remember the real li- lyrics. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Tama po ba lyrics ko? Okay, some of you don't know that song. But um, <clears throat> that's our world. The love of the self. Someone still wants me to sing it, but I won't. <laughs> Loving, learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Is that true? Our world today has so much about self-care, which I'm not against, but it has become the pinnacle of, of wholeness and healing, the love of self. But for me, in the Bible, I think, says that loving God is the greatest love that we can give ourselves. Not loving ourselves. Because our hearts are deceitful. Our hearts are selfish. Next would be betrayal of Judas. Daming betrayal, no? Daming abandonment. But um, Mark 14, 42 to 45 Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Even God, Jesus knows. Betray, and, and it says here, and immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came. One of the twelve, one of his disciples who was with him, witnessed all the miracles, heard all the teachings, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up at once and said, Rabbi, and then kissed him. Jesus knows who his true followers are. We can claim to be Christians, but he knows his sheep. Confession is not equal to sincere devotion to Christ. The question is for all of us here, Who's Jesus to you? Is he your God? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Does your heart, mind, soul belong to him or the world? And Jesus becomes an additive to your world. It's totally different that your world revolves around Jesus or you add Jesus to your world. It's a whole different picture. That's why a lot of people today deconstruct. Deconstruct in a way that I don't want to be a Christian anymore. Christianity promised a person who is a genie. Your relationships will be healed. You will be provided for. You're not going to be sick. Everything's going to be all right. And then trouble happens. A loved one was not healed. You lost your job. And then you say, you know what? Jesus is not real after all. Because I think Jesus does not answer my prayer. He cannot answer my prayers. And then you ended up leaving. Leaving Jesus, cursing Jesus, and saying bad things about Jesus. And you know what? All of us here, our actions reveal the sincerity of who we believe Jesus is. He's not a genie. He's not an additive to our life. He should be our life. So that's Judas. Next would be the fleeing of the twelve and the young man. Verse 50, And they all left him and fled. So that's what happened. He was arrested. Everyone left. Everyone who said, I will not deny you. Everyone who said that, Jesus, I'm, I'm not going to deny you. All of them said the same. Same as Peter. And all of them left, including the young man. A young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Our loyalty to Jesus or to Christ is tested when our lives are at stake. 
Am I right? We usually give in to sin when something big is at stake. And it's painful. Sometimes we don't really want to. <laughs> it's just we failed. But sometimes we want to because of our own convenience. These examples are supposed to encourage us in a way that Jesus is not surprised with our weaknesses, but it's also a warning. Warning that don't do as disciples did. That do not abandon Jesus for convenience. Do not abandon Jesus for our own self-interest and stand up for Jesus. Um, there's this church figure in our church history. Called, his name is Polycarp. And he's a prominent figure in church history. He was instructed by the apostles. So in the times of the apostles, he was a disciple of John. And um, he was an 86-year-old bishop. And he was arrested as an old man. He was sentenced to be burned due to persecution. And the only thing that he needed to do is to recant. The only thing that he needed to do is say, Caesar is Lord. Just a, just a tiny phrase. What you can do if you are wise, Caesar is Lord. And then after that, Worship Jesus again. That could be a wise thing to do. But the, what did he say? He's, uh, he's about to die. He's about to be burned at the face of death. As the face of, he could think of a lot of things. My church, my family, he could think of a lot of things why he can compromise. But this is what he said. 86 years, I have served him. And he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and savior? 86 years have I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and savior? Application for us, Jesus has never wronged us. All that Jesus desires is for us to live righteously, live for him, worship him, honor him experience true life in him? How can we deny him at the point of our weakness? How can we deny him at the point of, for our own convenience? And I can easily say this, that we should do this and that. But all of us have failed him, isn't it? Am I right? No, ako lang yun talaga. <laughs> have we? At a certain point in our life, we failed Jesus we lost the courage to fight for him. And um, some of us here, we feel that, um, I just feel that, you know, God is speaking in a way that you, at some point in your life, God play, you were in an ungodly relationship, but you gave in. And you feel that God, I was supposed to fight for you. But this person is stronger. Or sometimes in our office, do you have people who have unwholesome jokes? Young green jokes. And then everyone's doing the green jokes. And everyone's expecting for you to, you know, have a more wholesome joke. Or change the temperament of the joke. <laughs> but you ended up saying more unwholesome jokes. And then, are you a Christian? And then you realize, you go home, sorry Lord, I remember some stories and it felt so funny. Only to realize that you failed Jesus, even in those jokes. Or sometimes, some of us have prioritized convenience, filing our taxes, bribing a policeman so you won't have to get your ticket. Or maybe loss of courage that you were supposed to to stand up for Jesus. Are you a Christian? Ah, nag nga ako sa victory. Or sometimes you try to water down being a Christian then standing firm that I am a Christian. Mark 14, 28, it says here, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Why is this very important? 
Jesus knew that he's going to fail, that there he's going to be failed by his disciples. He will be arrested and experience a horrific death and he will be raised up. We see here that the disloyalty was the disciples' choice, but the restoration was Jesus' choice. He was going to die on the cross to bring people's sin, the world's sin, to death so that they can be reconciled to him. So what did Jesus accomplish on the cross? And I, I, I want to I wanna land this thing in a way that we can focus on the failures, but Jesus did something on the cross. Jesus did something on the cross so that you and I will not be condemned. You and I can live a life that we can still access him because he died for our sins. Peter, the one who denied him, said in 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on a tree, that he, we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we are healed. For we're straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of your soul. He was the one who denied. He was the part of the one who scattered by saying, Jesus did it. He himself bore our sins. For we were straying like sheep, like what Jesus said, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of our soul. I'm going to give you a fancy theological term, and, and it sounds fancy, penal substitutionary atonement. But it is the very heart of the gospel. That all the facets of the gospel shines from. What is it? All the penalty of sin has been placed on Jesus. Instead of us experiencing the pain and the wrath of God, all of it went to Jesus. So that you and I can be called righteous before Jesus. We cannot be in a place of grace without penal substitutionary atonement. Without Jesus carrying all the wrath, we cannot be in a place of grace. If you experience God's wrath, if it weren't for Jesus, but now we experience grace. Why? Because he himself bore our sins. You have eternal assurance that you will go to heaven, not to be condemned in hell, because he himself bore our sins. You experience what it means to be a child of God. You know what it means to be restored. You know what it means to love. You know what it means to, to have forgiveness because he himself bore our sins. You experience joy in your life. Anyone of you, you're a joyful Christian? Or sad Christian? Doesn't compute, right? <laughs> You have joy as a Christian, but there are those Christians that are, I always say this, yung parang nalugi, I can't do those things anymore, I'm a Christian. You should be living in joy, that you are with Jesus. You are able to experience true joy. Why? Because he himself bore our sins. Jesus bore our sins on the cross to mend our broken relationship with God. Our failures for his righteousness our alienation to his acceptance. From enemies of God to being a child of God. Despondence and emptiness to peace and joy in him. Eternal death to eternal life. My question for all of us, how does your life look like when you do not feel any condemnation but forgiveness? How healthy would your prayer life be knowing that you have access and, and being forgiven? How does the forgiveness and mercy and grace of God empower you to honor Him? Sometimes the extreme is, okay, Jesus knows how I, how I will sin. I'll do whatever I want. I can live my, way, my life in any way that I wanted to because He will understand and He will forgive. I think that's a wrong posture. The posture is, thank you, Jesus. I'm never deserving 
but you sacrificed for me and gave me righteousness. Therefore, I will honor you. All our iniquities and transgressions are paid for the blood of Jesus. Our response, our innate response, is to honor Him with our lives. I have here a picture of what Jesus has done for us. It's a receipt that talks about that Jesus has paid it all. Sin, the shackles of sin that has destroyed our lives is paid for. The shame of sin. You go out there with your thinking that this is my past, this happened to me, is paid for. The regrets that we have. Lord, why did I do this? Why did I do this? That's good, but it's paid for. You don't have to wallow in this. Your past mistakes, you don't have to wallow in them because it's paid for. Unforgiveness. Jesus gives you the power to forgive whoever that person is because you are forgiven. Hurt, anger, all these things are paid for. And it says here, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everything is paid for. So I'd like us to stand up as we worship together. The innate response is for us to worship Him. The goal of the word today is not to put us down that we failed Him. The goal is to worship Him. God, in my failure, forgive me. In my failure, you empower me to do what is right. And some of us here today, I feel that God is calling you to repent. And that includes me. When there were moments in our lives that we have prioritized sin. That's straight to the point. I want to sin. Later, God. I want to do this first. I'm going to enjoy the flesh first. Then I can say sorry. When we know, when we do that, we're destroying our lives. God calls you to repent. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we honor you. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We recognize that we cannot save ourselves. We recognize that sin has power. We recognize, Jesus, that you are more powerful than sin. Lord, we praise you. We thank you that despite our failures, despite our weakness, despite our human limitation, you love us. You care for us. You discipline us. You shepherd us. You lead us. You provide for us. You heal us. You make us taste and see your goodness. Lord, because of that, because of who you are and what you've done on the cross, help us worship you with our lives. Lord, we repent for the times that we have prioritized ourselves. When we have prioritized the craving of the flesh. When we prioritize our convenience. When we did not stand up for you when we're supposed to proclaim to the world that you are our Jesus. Lord, we repent. Help us today. And in that helping God, we give you our commitment. But God, it may not be a perfect road. It might not be a perfect journey. But God, whenever we fall, we will stand. Whenever we fall, we will, we will run to you. Whenever we sin, we will repent and stop. 
It is a continuous process, God, but thank you that you are our shepherd who will walk us through all these things. Lord, we give you our worship. We give you our hearts. And even as we take time to reflect on what you've done across this, this time of rest, this time of Holy Week, celebrating what you've done, may something resonate in our hearts of who you truly are in our lives. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all worship the Lord.
Praise God. I recall uh, the, the passage of scripture that Pastor Brando shared in Mark 14. The conversation between G- Jesus and, Ju- and Judas Tuller and Peter. He said, you know, you know, the scriptures always come true. You know, this is what, what's bound to happen and it will happen. And then, and then Peter sort of, you know, brushes him off and gives him a slight correction. No, it's not going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And then we all know what happened later. Uh, and it, that, that you, you can find that in Mark 14. It says, it says there, But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And then, so, then Peter had another idea. But what's interesting is, so it, we all know what happened, that Jesus, everything that Jesus said was true. And then one morning, and then of course he was arrested, tortured, and killed. And then one morning, uh, two of his disciples they're women, um, Mary Magdalene and the mother of Jesus, uh, went to visit the tomb and, and were expecting to see a corpse. And, and they came there to treat the corpse. And then, but they, to their surprise, they saw something else. They saw a rolled away stone in Mark 16, verse... Where is it there? They saw a, rolled away, a stone rolled back. It was very large. Then entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. They were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. He was crucified. He has risen. He's not here, the angel said. See the place where they laid him. Go ahead. Don't, don't take my word for it. Go ahead. Check. See for yourself. He's not here. And then, but go, tell his disciples and Peter. Jesus, before he left the tomb, maybe, you know, knew what was going to happen. You know, the the girls were going to come visit. And then he told told the the angel, you know, when they they visit, tell them to, tell them this. And, And he specially mentioned Peter. It was, it, it was almost like him restoring, referring back to their conversation. Because this is what he said. Tell disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. So Jesus specifically mentioned to tell Peter that all is well. You failed me, but I, I never did fail you. Not a single moment that I failed you. I knew you were going to fail me, but I knew what I was going to do. And that was to restore you. And that moment, he made sure that Peter gets the message. And that message empowers all of us today. That message of reconciliation and restoration, despite our failures, is the very reason why we're singing songs of worship today. And it's the very reason that we can go back out there and look at your office mates, look at your household, members of your household with compassion. Look at the failures of the world like you and I and see them with compassion and desire restoration and reconciliation with God. May that truth empower us today. Amen? Lord, as we go, we're excited to follow you. We're excited to honor you. As we go, we're excited to represent you well. As we go, empower us. As we go, give us the the courage to stand up for you. And as we go, Lord, give us the the moments to represent you well and the, the power to do just that. That we wouldn't crumble under temptation. That we would know what to do. We would know what to say because we are near you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You're all dismissed. If you need prayers, we're here uh, to pray for you.
This is your church, God. Bill. 